I'm going to take up on uh, the more than conquerors, but I just want to to initially just you know as I as I've travelled around, and I I spend a lot of time in the churches, and I I travel quite uniquely interdenominationally, because of the nature of the ministry, and you get quite a a good sort of overview, and you see. Uh, all the different assortment of, of Christians and Christian churches. And you look around it and, uh, you know, uh, God is in charge. He's absolutely in charge. He hasn't lost control for one single second. So um, it's not my job or anyone's job to fix up the church. Just get in there and preach the gospel. But this really occurred to me, John chapter 5, 39 and 40. Jesus says this. He says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are that testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me. You search the scriptures day and night. You study them day and night because you think you have eternal life, that they have eternal life. And these are the words that testify of me, but you are not willing to come to me. And I think there is such a huge difference. It's like Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. It says, these people draw to, near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. We see the fulfillment in Matthew 13, 14 and 15, and talks the prophecy of Isaiah saying, Hearing you will hear and not understand, and seeing you will see but not understand perceive just talking about blind eyes and deaf ears and it's it's sort of summed up obviously in 1 Corinthians 2 14 where it says but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned the man without the spirit, does not understand. It doesn't matter how intellectually advanced he has pushed himself. He does not understand. The man without the spirit does not understand because it's a simple bottom line and God has ordained it. He cannot understand. Why? Because God has ordained it so. Without the spirit, without God, you can't understand. And does it not make sense that if God has created everything in this world, he has made it impossible for man to find fulfillment and understanding and peace any other way than his way. Because it is ordained that way. I mean, he made man, come let us make man in our own image. And the spirit in man we know is the image it made us superior to other creations, but it was a communication as aspect of the relationship. He gave us dominion and he gave us our own will because he didn't want robots. But we were tempted, succumbed, and died spiritually. Now, this to me is the important part. Jesus restored the spiritual link. In his death, burial, resurrection, Gethsemane, Calvary, garden tomb, Jesus was the restorer. It was not love or grace or mercy or the gospel or the church or Christianity or religion. It was Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. Of course, he was in every one of those things. He is every one of those things. But it is in Jesus and in him alone. He is the Savior. He is the Redeemer. And he is all sufficient in himself. 
And I have found that that has been a problem over the years, even for the church. Yes, but Peter, you see, you can't replace Jesus in any shape or form. I mean, we were given the Bible. God's word was born. And, you know, we know that God's word is not a history lesson, nor a scientific lesson, but it does not deny either of those two things. But God's word was his revelation of himself to us, his creations. It's not a system or a method or a religion or a secret formula. It's not something that we can earn or merit or learn or acquire. And that needs to be preached over and over again. It's, it's, a, it's a revelation that only comes from him. I mean, Paul talked about preaching the gospel and saying that the gospel was the revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And it's important that we see it in that context and we, we, we teach it in that context. I mean, how do we read the Bible? How do I read the Bible? Do I read the Bible? And you will understand what I'm saying. Do I read the, the, the Bible with my mind and intellect or am I reading my Bible with my heart? I think there's a big difference between those two things. I can read it with my intellect. This is the self. But is it here or am I reading it with my heart? You know, we look, we see uh, King Solomon. Uh, King Solomon, in the early days of, of, of his relationship with God, he wrote the Proverbs. And then more and more as the world got through, in, through to him, you see him writing the book of Ecclesiastes. And you, there's, a, there's a bit of a subtle difference between the two. And you see the, the difference in the spirit and soul, the, the world had got through to him. And I think we have to ask ourselves the question, are we writing? Are we writing our book, our testimony uh, as Proverbs or are we Ecclesiastes? Have we allowed the world to take us to the cleaners, because it is doing that job. The Bible serves, it can either serve as a manual or a textbook, or it can serve as the spiritual well and oasis in life's desert for each one of us. And it's important where we put it in one of those two places. It's your skeleton, maybe, or is it your very lifeblood. Like, read it with your heart. I found, I, I get up early in the morning, I, I, I read it out loud to myself, and I, I, I try and, and I read it out slow. I mean, John 5, 38 says, yeah, you don't have his word abiding in you. And as I travel around, I've always heard people say, the word, the word, the word, the word. And I, they are so, so right, but they also so, so wrong. Because it's no good having the word where there's no life and there's no passion. It has to become a living word. Now, obviously, that's just the introduction. I just want to deal with this. And now, just listen to me. As, as I say this, I'm going to read it, it slowly. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And then he said, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am persuaded, says Paul strong word. 
I am persuaded. I am convicted. I am convinced. I am utterly, irrefutably compelled to believe this that I am writing. That we are more than conquerors. Now, I see it a little bit like this. I see that the more than, when he says we are more than conquerors, more than means to me that there is no English, Greek, or human word or intellectual disposition that can really describe the spiritual condition of truly being with Jesus. It is in Describable, totally impossible to describe. It's a relationship, it's relational, it's experiential. It is that as well as the other things that we have presented. I mean, when you look at the word conqueror, a conqueror is a strong word. It is another strong word. And it conjures up in, in the human the thoughts of like, immense power, uh, physically, maybe mentally, intellectually, materially. But this conqueror is infinitely greater than that. It's greater, it's more than a conqueror. It's not just a conqueror, Paul is saying to us, this isn't just a conqueror, you are more than a conqueror. Not just in the physical and material, spiritually, you are so much more, so much, it's infinitely greater. It's awesome beyond our, uh, our imagination, beyond our understanding. My ways and your ways, as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my ways above your ways. When are you going to believe that? When it's incomprehensible, this relationship with me. It's more, we are more than crusaders. We really are more than for crusaders. And please don't get me wrong, I'm not undermining these things. But we are more than crusaders fighting causes or building temples or debating doctrines or trying to change the world. We are more than that. So much more than that. Who shall separate us? Who? Tribulation, distress, famine, persecution, nakedness, peril, sword, nor death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate us from God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, in him alone. All sufficiency, all authority. Friends, the real church is alive and exceedingly well right at the moment. It is alive and exceedingly well. God has not lost control for one single, single second. Nothing is happening that is taking him by surprise. He is absolutely, utterly in control, whether we want to believe it. The kingdom is on track. There's no hitches, glitches, shocks, or surprises. And we need to be careful not to be caught up in what's going on out there. The fear. Church has been closed up, really. And everyone says, no, this is, this is, this is fine. I have decided to follow Jesus. That's what happened to me one night at the bottom end of the garden. I had decided to follow Jesus, and it was very specific. I gave my life to Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus. The cross before me, the world 
walked behind me, no talking, no turning back. You know, seven months ago, I lost Honest, my wife. It hit me powerfully. And I got a lot of friends and a lot of people who've sent me, and they sent me scriptures. And it was lovely. I got all the scriptures. But friends, I needed more than a scripture. The scriptures didn't help. Jesus Christ was my only help. Only Jesus. And that was the reality of it. I got to experience firsthand that only Jesus Christ made the difference. And it was lovely. God bless all those wonderful well-wishers that came and saw us and came and, 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 and hugged me and came and said lovely words to me and all that stuff. But you know, when I lay on my bed, and even today, all I needed and all I need is Jesus. Jesus and more Jesus. Blessed assurance, you know that hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Blessed assurance, to have this assurance. I hear people, I hear sometimes I don't watch the TV too much. But I hear the pastors getting up there trying to assure their people that they saved and trying to, and at all the time, just trying to assure them. But when you really know the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't need that assurance. You have it. This thing says blessed assurance. Because blessed assurance says Jesus is mine. I have the blessed assurance of knowing that Jesus Christ is mine. He is mine. You can't take him away. He is my Lord and my Savior. Doesn't matter what you would say. And he is. He is the source of everything. I don't need. I mean, Hebrews 11, 1, when it, when it defines for us faith. Faith is to be sure of what you hope for and certain of, of what you do not see. Sure, I, I had on there to be absolutely sure of what you hope for and absolutely certain of what you do not see. So if the other side of the coin is that if you do not have those two things, you actually don't have faith. How come everyone's so unsure, so much unbelief and lukewarmness and backsliding and apathy? I want to tell you something's wrong. Something's wrong with the root. There is a fundamental radical flaw. Something is wrong. There's no Jesus. I don't have to convince myself and others that I am free. I don't have to convince myself that I am free. I am free. And you know, when I hear continuous self-affirmation, it sounds alarm bells and like empty vessels make the most noise. Whom the sun has set free is free Indeed, John 8, 36. I know that I know that I know that I know in my knower. Charles Gordon always used to say that to us in the early days. He was the pastor of the big Presbyterian church. I know I know in my knower. In quietness and confidence and humility is my strength. We talk about redemption. I am so free that I have chosen to become a slave of righteousness. I am so free. I have chosen that. I have chosen to become a bond servant and love every moment of it. Every single moment, every moment that I can have with my Lord Jesus Christ. I, 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 I do believe it's so important because whether we want to believe it or not, even as we're preaching, we are preaching not necessarily the words that we're preaching. We are preaching what we are, what our heart is. Spiritually, that is what we are sending out. 
a fear of God, the beginning of wisdom. I fear him. I don't fear him for the Ten Commandments. It's the awesomeness of God. God is so awesome, and I thank God for my sort of Presbyterian upbringing because we were brought up to, to, to really understand that he's an awesome, sovereign God. That was an absolute. That wasn't even up for any discussion. I found the pearl of great price. Once you find the pearl of great price, everything else pales into insignificance by comparison. The guy sold her everything. I found Jesus. I have found Jesus. By his stripes I'm healed, I am. I've been born of the spirit, never to die there, never to be separated from God. The devil can't touch me spiritually. Yes, yeah, he can let my tires down, that's for sure. But it's an absolute statement. I have been healed by, by his stripes. This is a spiritual healing. I've been connected by his stripes. And it's an absolute statement declaring an absolute spiritual truth. And I am in the world and not of the world. You know, we keep telling people, well, you know, you need to be in the, in the world, but uh, not of the world. I want to tell you something, that I do believe that if Jesus Christ is truly Lord of your life, you will be in the world and not of the world. It will be a, just a natural consequence of your relationship with the Lord. You will be in the world. If you love him more than anything else in the world, you will be in the world and not of the world. Holiness is separation unto God. It's not a halo and a harp and a good CV. My kingdom is not of this world. I mean, how many times does God have to t tell us that? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nations are a drop in the bucket. Rulers are wheat and chaff. I pray not for this world. I understand totally. By grace I'm saved. People teach all sorts of different things about grace. Unmerited favor. That was what I was told the first time uh, th that I got saved. I earn nothing. I deserve nothing. It's unmerited favor. The more I understand my wretchedness and my undeservedness, the more I marvel at his grace in being able to accommodate one such as me. Grace, love, and mercy. I've written a few books. I suppose 20 years ago, I would have probably been arrogant enough to think I could write a book on the grace and the love and the mercy of God. I wouldn't dare to do that now because I don't believe anyone can, because I don't believe anyone un truly understands it. I don't understand the love and the grace and the mercy of God. I don't understand it, but I live in it. And I preach about it. You know, when we look at Paul, Paul did not support a cause. He belonged absolutely to Jesus Christ. He saw nothing else and lived for nothing else. He said, I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. The chief motivation for Paul's service was not love for others or the cause of humanity, but the love of his Lord. Peter, I mean, Peter, when Peter was restored, he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me more than anything else in the world? Because honestly, I only believe only then can you truly feed his sheep. If you love Jesus more than anything else in this world. You see, what I'm saying is that 
It's a passion. An adoration. A total dependence. To be preached. It's, it's, it's not... It, 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 it's it's not a theory. It's so much more than that. I'll never forget, and I'll finish with this. I'll never forget my old pastor. Our family had a pastor. His name was Emlyn Jones. He was a very well-known Presbyterian pastor in South Africa. Pastored many. Lovely guy. Lovely Welshman. He had a mop of hair that stood out here. And he preached. He preached Jesus and Jesus and Jesus. And he was the family pastor. He did the weddings and, and the christenings. Uh, but fortunately, there weren't too many deaths in those days. And in return, he was a, a, a rugby and cricket fanatic. My brother and I always used to organize him test tickets at the rugby tests and the cricket tests. And he appreciated all that. Anyway, we hadn't seen him for many years. And then Ines and I got saved here in Durban. And I felt I, I needed to find Emlyn just to tell him. And I found out that he was, in fact, uh, I'm in Durban, he's in Maritzburg. Some people run that, that distance. But it's just up the road. And uh, Arnes and I decided, we found out that he was dying. He was actually in a hospice. And uh, he was dying and we found out where it was. And we went, we got in a car and we drove to Peter Marisburg. And I'll never forget walking into his room, single room that he had. He was lying on his bed. And as I got up to him through his, uh, through his uh, weary old eyes, his he looked up at me and recognized me and he said, Peter, he said, to what do I owe this honor? So I said, Emlyn, Ines and I just wanted to tell you that we're born again. You know, he looked at me and he said, oh, the power of prayer. Oh, the power of prayer. And then he said to us, he said, you know, when I first went into the ministry, and that was a long time ago, I think he was in the ministry some 70 years. And he said, when he first went into the ministry, he had decided that he was going to, he was going to produce the greatest debut sermon in the history of the Presbyterian Church. So he set everything up. And he got up into the pulpit and he said he couldn't present his message. He said all he could do when he got up there, he burst into tears. And he just told the people how much he loved Jesus. But he said that his love for Jesus then was infinitesimal by comparison to his love for Jesus now, 70 years later. And then he said, Peter, he said, I've lived a long time. He said... I've done some things that I perhaps would be quite proud of. Other things that I wasn't so happy about. He said, the longer I've lived, the more I realize how little I know. He said, I've seen a lot of things, experienced a lot of things. And there's a lot of things that I don't know. But as I go to be with my Lord, I can leave you, Peter, with one absolute truth. And it was the last thing he ever said to me and Ines. He said, Peter, nothing, absolutely nothing in this world is worthwhile if you haven't found Jesus. Nothing in this world is worthwhile if you haven't found Jesus. We said, Cheerio, he died a couple of days later. And I just leave that challenge with each and every one of you again. It's a challenge we need to hear. I need to preach to myself day in and day out. I know in whom I believe. We are more than conquerors. It's so much more. He is an awesome God. God hasn't lost control for one single second.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.